Hi, this is Mrs. Alexander, and today's front load is going to be about Unit 1.23, DNA Analysis and Profiling for Project Lead the Way Biomed. The first question we're going to answer today is, how can the tools used in molecular biology be actually used to compare the DNA of two different people? Well, we did DNA extraction in class last lesson, and today we're going to learn about DNA amplification and the analysis of DNA. So today some of the things we're going to go over is what is PCR, what are restriction enzymes, and what's gel electrophoresis. Most people know that DNA is the component that makes us unique and different from every individual. The part of DNA that makes us unique is the sequence or the code. It's the letters of the chemicals that make up the DNA, the adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. The order in which these bases, these nitrogen bases appear, is what makes your sequence. Criminal investigators can take a snapshot of the sequence using something called DNA profiling. Now a profile is just a profile, it's not an exact match, so understand that some of the techniques we're going to learn are still considered a presumptive test. So the first thing that profilers must do is they must add something to a sample of DNA called a restriction enzyme. Restriction enzymes will go into someone's DNA and cut it into little pieces based on a specific set of instructions that the scientists give it. Now that kind of sounds weird, but a scientist can take a special enzyme. I mean, what are enzymes? They are in proteins that speed up chemical reactions. So they take an enzyme, and the job of it is to cut up DNA. So it helps it do that faster. And we actually program these enzymes to cut the DNA in special places. We'll cut it in the same place for every single suspect's DNA that we look at for a specific lab, and the way that it cuts the person's DNA will determine how many bases and how many pieces it cuts it into. Someone in the class could have 12 pieces in their DNA segment, so could someone else. But just because they have the same number of pieces doesn't mean that they have the same DNA sequence. So profiles can match, but sequences are different. So let's get into restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are degradative, which means destructive, enzymes that recognize a specific sequence of bases and cuts it in that specific place. You guys will get to do this job. You'll get to pretend you're a restriction enzyme in class and go through the suspect's DNA and mark it for a certain place to cut. This attaches to the DNA, reads the sequences, and then it breaks the covalent bonds between the sugars and the phosphates. Then it will cut the DNA into multiple pieces. Remember, in class, we learned that covalent bonds are really hard to break apart. That's why we need to use a restriction enzyme to do it. Unlike the hydrogen bonds, which are in the middle of the bases, which can be easily unzipped by a different enzyme called DNA helicase. A little interesting information, we actually found restriction enzymes in bacteria. There's a type of bacteria that will go in and eat away at protein, and we've been able to manufacture that in the lab to make it only eat away at what we want it to eat away at. So it's kind of cool how we can do that and genetically modify bacteria to, to do what we want them to do. So when you think of a restriction enzyme, I want you to think of like a molecular pair of scissors that goes in there and snips where you want it to snip. In class, we'll learn about where we're going to snip our pieces, and it will break those bonds. Again, remember covalent bonds are within a single strand. The hydrogen bonds are between the bases of the strands. So we are not cutting down the middle horizontally we are cutting up and down vertically. So if you take a look at that picture, you've got a sequence on the top that says GAA, TTC. The bottom strand is its match. We call that its complementary strand. It complements it, or it's the opposite of it. G pairs with C, A and T pair. So we put the restriction enzyme into a sample. So you collect someone's spit from a crime scene. You put this little restriction enzyme, which is form formed from a bacteria, it goes in there, you heat it up, you let it do its thing, and it will cut the piece of DNA, the GAA TTC, it'll cut it wherever you've programmed it to. And in this case, it cuts it after the first G and after the last A. There are all sorts of restriction enzymes. Some restriction enzymes just cut straight down all the way across, whereas some, like in the picture shown, will cut and have like little sticky ends is what we call them. So again, never cut horizontally through the middle, the two pieces apart, you're cutting up and down, vertically. We abbreviate these little tiny snips or pieces as restriction fragment length polymorphisms. Big words. Restriction for the restriction enzyme. Fragments, because they're pieces. 
links, because they're different links, polymorphism means varying or different. Polymorphism is a different sequence. So these pieces are all different sizes, and you can go back to this picture right here, and you can actually cut count how many of the different bases are in each piece. And based on their size, we can put them into a special machine called an electrophoresis machine and separate them. Scientists use these RFLPs, or Restriction Fragment Link Polymorphisms, kind of like a set of puzzle pieces to make a profile for a bunch of different suspects. So my little picture down there of a family, you've got mom, dad, daughter one, daughter two, son one, and son two, they're color-coded for you. You can see mom and dad have, have different bands, those are the different pieces that were cut, and then each kid gets one from mom, one from dad, and some of their own unique mixtures. What are restriction fragment link polymorphisms? Again, they are little pieces of DNA that have been cut specifically to see if you, your profile matches a suspect's. So the chromosomes can result in different patterns and those fragments or links can be counted by base pairs. When you're counting a base pair, it's important to know that the top and the bottom strand, like pictured here, the G on top and the C on the bottom are a base pair, they stay together. So that total pair is considered one base pair. So if I were to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That piece right there has 23 base pairs. I didn't count the top and the bottom, I just counted them together as a base pair. A pair is two. After you've got your base pairs cut up in a sample of DNA, kind of like we did the other day in class where we took our own saliva and we pulled it out of um, the test tube and we looked at it, you'd take that sample, you'd put bacteria in it, it would cut it, and you'd take that and you put it into a gel, kind of like Jello, but we call it agarose gel, and that gel is designed to separate it by size. It uses an electromagnetic field to pull DNA from one side to the other. In class, we learned that DNA has a negative charge. That negative charge can be loaded into the negative end of the gel, and it can be pulled through the gel using magnets to the positive end. And so it will move towards the positive side of the gel. The further the piece moves, the smaller it is, because it's faster and it goes further. The larger the piece is, or the heavier it is, the slower it goes through the gel, so it'll be closer to the negative end where you loaded it. So you need to know that DNA is negatively charged, Electrophoresis machine separates fragments by size and electrical charge. But not a lot of DNA exists in each sample. You saw in class how much DNA you got from a big old spit worth of DNA from the salt water solution you gargled or swished with. Now, when you're thinking about collecting crime scene evidence, there's usually maybe a little drop of blood, or you might have a swab from a suspect's mouth. It really depends, and sometimes it's, it's degraded or sometimes it's contaminated and you can't get that much. So there's a process called DNA amplification. To amplify means to make more. And what that does, it's a way to use um, science to create more of a specific sequence or pattern of DNA. So we've got a bunch of DNA and only certain portions of it are coding regions. And we can go in there with a restriction fragment length, a uh, restriction enzyme, and we can pick out a section of the DNA we want to make more of, so we can analyze it. We call the process of amplification, we call it PCR. All you need to know is that PCR makes more DNA, or it amplifies it. It stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's a reaction where you create more nucleotides or more sequences. You'll learn about polymerase in another probably your general biology class, creates more DNA to the ends. Well, we can do that in the lab, too. We have a sample of your DNA, put it in this machine, do PCR on it, and it will actually create more of it so we can sample it and run it through a gel for electrophoresis. So again, you need to know that PCR is the process of making more DNA. So the gel electrophoresis machine is kind of like a little plate of Jello. It's a special type of jello. Um, it's called agarose gel, and we hook it up to an electrode. We pour this special buffer in. The buffer is kind of like a salt water or a special percentage. And then we can load or squirt each DNA sample into each well or each little hole. So we make a mold with this agarose gel, and depending on how many people you're testing, how many different suspects, you put a marker or you put an example in on one, the very first well, 
and then you put all the different samples in, each one goes in its own spot. And then when you hook it up to the charge, all the DNA will move at different rates. And you'll get this profile picture, you'll get these banding patterns. So if someone has three RFLPs, restriction fragment length polymorphins, morphisms, and one of them has 20 bases, one of them has 30, and one of them has 40, they'll have three bands, one marked at 20, one marked at 30, and one marked at 40. You look at somebody else's profile, they might have 10 bands. You look at a third person, they might only have two. But sometimes you have the same number of bands in the same places, but if you look at the actual sequence, it's not the same. Here's a picture of the electrophoresis machine. So I'm showing you the mixture of DNA molecules of different sizes. They are put in the different wells. Um, you need to know that the negative end is where you load it. That's because DNA is negatively charged. You stick it into the negative end because when you turn on the power, it's going to move towards the positive. If you were to flip-flop this and do that the opposite, then your DNA would run off the end of your gel because it wouldn't have any space. So right in here where it says cathode, that is the negative end. That's where the DNA goes in, and you hook it up, and it goes this way towards the positive end or the anode. If you were to accidentally hook it up the wrong way and put the holes on this side, it would just run still towards the positive end, but there would be no more gel left. If you do it correctly, you should see all these different banding patterns. Shorter molecules go further. Larger molecules go slower. So the larger molecules stay closer to where you loaded them because they're slower and heavier, whereas the shorter molecules move further and go faster. You hook it up for too long, and yes, they could run all the way off the gel, but that's why there's a specific time you run this for as well. So please understand what frictional resistance is. It's the resistance of the particles going through that gel with electrical force. It has some resistance on it. The further it moves, the faster. The further and the faster it moves is the smaller the particle. Here's what the final product looks like. The picture on the left is a really cool gel that you put um, glow-in-the-dark gel into it and glow-in-the-dark dye so you can see it under a special light. The one on the right shows you um, a black and white photo. You guys are going to get to do this in class, and you're going to make a paper gel as an example. And then later in the year, you're going to actually get to use the suspect's DNA to test for a disease. So diseases, how does that have to do with it? Well, you can look at someone's profile and figure out if they have a disease or not. You can use it as a presumptive test because more than one person can have the same number and size RFLPs, restriction fragment length polymorphisms. But when you look at the actual sequence of the bases, they should be unique unless they're identical twins. We can use profiling to, to match a suspect and eliminate the other people, and then we can look at that suspect's actual DNA and match the sequence. Um, it's a great way to do paternity or possible fathers of a baby. We can match bone or parts of DNA found from really old cases where maybe there's not a lot of DNA left, genealogy or where your ancestors are from, anthropology, archaeology, we can study what kind of bones are found if they were human or if they were animal and what kind of race they were from, and ethnicity. And then to diagnose diseases, and we'll get to diagnose a disease later in class and see if Anna has something called FH or high cholesterol, basically. Again, DNA profiling is not confirmatory. It is a presumptive test. In order to confirm DNA or to analyze DNA, you must look at the actual sequence. So do they have the exact sequence as the DNA pattern that you're looking at? Video for homework. I want you to watch these two videos. They're engaging ways to learn more about how to amplify segments of DNA and how to use an electrophoresis machine. And then I'd like you to do this virtual simulation through the Genetic Science Learning Center.